BCY America presents Crosstalk, a nationwide call-in program discussing issues that have an effect on our families, our communities, our churches, our nation, and our world. Crosstalk, an opportunity for you to voice your concerns for biblical principles. And now live by satellite and around the world on the Internet at vcyamerica.org. Here is today's Crosstalk. And welcome to Crosstalk here on the VCY American Network. Folks, we have a very important issue to talk about today as we're going to be looking at privacy concerns. And uh, certainly we are seeing Big Brother get bigger all the time. And who it is that is watching you, and it seems like it's happening in just about every vestige of life. We're going to be talking today with... Uh, someone that I, I believe is the foremost authority on this issue, Dr. Katherine Albrecht. She is a privacy expert, a consumer activist, an award-winning author and broadcaster who helped develop StartPage.com. It's the world's most private search engine. Uh, she co-authored the best-selling RFID book called Spy Chips, How Major Corporations and Government Plan to Track Your Every Move with RFID, and also The Spy Chips Threat, Why Christians Should Resist RFID and Electronic Surveillance. Uh, her efforts have put an end to human microchipping trials since 2007 and have slowed many other invasive programs. Catherine has authored legislation and testified before the FTC and lawmakers around the world. Catherine, thanks for joining us today on Crosstalk. I'm delighted to be on with you today, and blessings to you and your listeners. Thanks so much. Uh, WND, World Net Daily, had carried a, a story late last year that uh, spoke of a whistleblower from the National Security Agency who says everyone in the U.S. is under virtual surveillance by federal authorities. Uh, Catherine, do you believe that's an overstatement? No, I think it. I, I, we are contributing to these databases, and then the federal government simply taps into them. So what, what's really happened, I think, over the last couple of decades and certainly over the last generation or two, is that our tools, our technological tools that make life more efficient and, and give us all of these great benefits also come with, a, with a, a downside, a dark side. And that is that they, as we have more and more society and the government has more and more data storage capability and we are leaving more and more breadcrumbs about our lives, those two things now are beginning to come together in, in a really spectacularly immense way that I think people really don't understand. And I'm not even sure that we're capable of stepping back and grasping the enormity of, of the control apparatus and, and the amount of surveillance that's actually happening to us. But we're playing a role in that every single day. Um, simply by walking down the street, we're getting our, our pictures captured in, in biometrics, uh, facial recognition, and all of that going into uh, through surveillance cameras. By going onto the Internet, we're leaving breadcrumbs of every place that we go. We're uh, using tracking cookies. We're putting uh, intimate information about ourselves up on Facebook. We're writing emails to one another without realizing that those emails are winding up um, into giant databases with even more information about us. So it really has become, I think it's happen too quickly for the average person to really fully get the impact of, of, what's, of, of, of what we're doing nowadays. Now, your bio had indicated that you helped develop something called StartPage, a private search engine. Uh, many people think, well, my searches are private. You know, so often we hear the terms, just Google it. Uh, what mm -hmm. can, what, tell us about the tracking of Internet searches. Well, you know, it's interesting. Last week, um, Google got into a tiff with some Swedish dictionary makers and said, you can't use Google as a verb. We don't want you to say Google it. And uh, I, I was jumping up and down going, hooray, because I don't want you to say Google it either. <laughs> I'm a radio host myself, and every day radio hosts and just regular people give billions of dollars of free advertising to Google by using their name as a verb. And the reality is Google is a multi-billion dollar corporation. It is not the you know big friend or your, your best buddy in the guy who just wants to answer all your questions, Google has actually over the last, you know, quietly over the last 10 years, amassed the largest dossier of personal information on individuals ever collected in the history of humanity. And when I say that, Google knows more about every single person listening to this radio broadcast than the NSA, the FBI, the CIA, and the IRS combined. And that is because Google is not what we think it is. We think of Google as this wonderful answer provider that, that we kind of take for granted. We get a brand-new computer, and we open up the browser to go on the Internet, and there's Google. Uh, oftentimes, it's the home page. It's up in that upper right-hand corner in that little search box on all your search windows. It's probably right there on your phone. 
and everybody just kind of logs on as though it were some kind of public service being provided to us. But what, what's actually happening, and probably the best way to understand what Google really is, is um, to, you know, I'll tell my own story here. Back in the 1980s, I got a degree in um, business administration and marketing. And one of the concerns then, this is before the Internet, was uh, my professor said, You're, the, the biggest challenge we face is how to get accurate information from consumers about their lives. And if you were to call somebody up on the phone and say, hey, I'm a marketer, I, I'm just poking around for information, can you tell me, do, do you have any issues with alcoholism, or, or are you in foreclosure or bankruptcy, do you have hemorrhoids? <laughs> People yeah. would say, take a hike, I'm not going to answer any of these questions. Yeah. So what Google hit on, and it was sheer marketing brilliance, because Google is an advertising marketing company, they're not an information providing company, is they hit on this idea that if they create a little window and put it on everybody's computers, that all of the people that they otherwise could not get information about would log on 5, 10, 20 times a day and contribute information themselves. So every time we log on to Google and we say, hey, I'm looking to make, a, I, I don't know, can you give me a recipe for, for matzo Passover uh, recipes? They, oh, you're Jewish. Or can you give me uh, information about local oncologists in my community? Oh, you have cancer. So every single time that we log on to Google, and the same is also true of Yahoo and Bing, they're just not quite as big, we are essentially putting these breadcrumbs into this gigantic database that has your name at the very top. You know, it's, this is not just generic information. They have a picture of the front of your home through their Street View program. They have a picture of your backyard. They know how big your swimming pool is or how tiny your deck is because they're watching you from space with their satellite images. And the, just the amount of information that we provide on a daily basis by using Google is mind-blowing. Mm. So when I first discovered this, I had done all of my privacy research using Google as a search engine as my primary research tool, like everybody else in, in the country, in the world. And when I discovered what Google was really doing, it was very difficult for me to stop saying Google it. <laughs> it was very difficult for me to say, well, what am I going to do instead? Mm -hmm. And the reality is there were no private alternatives. So I connected with a little company over in Europe where they have very stringent privacy laws and helped to create startpage.com which is, um, you know, you can find it online, startpage.com, S-T-A-R-T, page.com. And what StartPage is, is it's a private portal that allows you to access Google results without ever making direct contact with Google. So, for example, if you go to startpage.com and you put in bankruptcy or foreclosure or, you know, cancer treatments, what we do is we take your search, we strip out anything that would identify you, like your IP address or any cookies, we submit it clean from our servers, so Google never even sees. We give it to Google, but they never see anybody but us. We then get a clean stream back from them. We pay them a, a tiny micro payment for every search that we do. We get the results back from them. We strip out all the tracking cookies or things that they would try to use to identify you, and then we serve you those results cleanly. So we're giving you 100% actual Google results with none of the tracking, and then we delete all records from our servers that you were ever there. So we do not record IP addresses. We make no record of what you searched for. And if we were to be hacked or subpoenaed, both of which happen to Google regularly, and they have to turn over thousands of people's information every year to the federal government, if that were to happen to us, there would be nothing to turn over because there's nothing stored. So startpage.com, if Google doesn't want people saying mm -hmm. Google it, we're cool with that. We say start page it around here. And, and I'm looking at it right now. It says the world's most private search engine, but then it also says that it's enhanced by Google. Does that mean yeah, that it's Yeah, so let the... me explain that mm -hmm. because um, that's a great question. So when you get to start page, it, you've got the same search box that you would normally see. The enhanced by Google does not mean that we have any kind of, you know, we're not owned by them. The only relationship that we have with them is that contractual relationship that we pay a micropayment for every search that we submit to them. And that was actually one of their requirements, that if we're going to serve up an actual Google stream, that we would have to put their name on our website. So you can see it there. But if you click the details um, right under that, it explains uh, how that relationship works. So we do not submit any information about our users to Google ever under any circumstances. And we're also third-party certified by some of the most stringent uh, data protection authorities in Europe who have gone over all of our data handling with a fine-tooth comb, and we've gotten their highest uh, possible ratings year after year. So it's startpage.com for private yes. Internet searches. Uh, what about email? Uh, can we trust as private communication between two individuals? Email? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, now let's talk about email. So StartPage is our, our free service. And one more thing I want to mention about StartPage is I want to encourage people that Google, you know, that little um, search window in the upper right-hand corner of your browser that defaults to Google. Google paid for that placement. And you can switch that to StartPage very easily at startpage.com. Right underneath, it will say set. Uh, it'll say add to Internet Explorer or add to Safari or whatever you're using. If you click those instructions, it'll add StartPage to that upper right hand corner, so you can search privately wherever you go. So I want to encourage people to to try that. It doesn't take Google away. Google is still a pull down option if you decide you want to switch back but it gives you that private option. Now let's talk about email. So StartPage is a free service. It's paid for by ads. We, we run, if you search for toothpaste, you'll get one, two, or three toothpaste ads that have nothing to do with you, just with your search term. You can click on those or not, as, as you see fit. But email is a different story. We decided uh, two years ago that we wanted to develop a private email product after we discovered what Google was doing with Gmail. And what we found out was that you cannot provide free email to millions of customers. It costs about $5 a month to be able to provide all of the storage and the data handling and the this is and the that's and spam filtering. And what Google is doing is they're giving you a $5 service a month for free. And people say, well, you know, why, why should I pay anything for email if I get this great free product? And the answer is it's really not a product. It's really bait, and you are the product. So what, what Google is doing, and the same is also true with Hotmail and Yahoo and, and all the other free um, email programs out there, is they're providing you – see, think about this. Get back into the mindset of the marketer. The marketer wants to know everything about you and knows that you won't reveal that. So what better way to get an inside view of your life than to provide you with a free email service and then write into the fine print that they have the right to read every single thing that you send and receive? And that's exactly what they've done. If you read the fine print, you will discover that if you have a Gmail account or a Hotmail account or a Yahoo account, that they read all of your email, they take all of the things that you write about, and they add them to your personal profile that they're keeping on you. That, By the way, you don't have a right to see. They, um, if you put a, an attachment on there, they scan the attachment and put it right into your file. And in my case, I'm a breast cancer survivor, and a couple years back my doctor said, uh, wanted me to send her my most recent blood test results. And I said, sure, yeah, I can, I can just email those to you as an attachment. Well, she gave me her email address, and it was Dr. You know, so-and-so at gmail.com. And I said, I can't, I can't send you my, even though I don't have a Gmail account, if I send you my medical records, Google is going to open up that PDF. They're going to see my name at the top. They're going to strip out. They're going to, they're going to know my patient ID number, my date of birth, my oncologist's name, my insurance information, the date of my blood test, and all my blood test results and put all of those into my personal profile. I, I wound up faxing her that information instead, but I think of how many millions of people are sending information through Gmail with no clue that this is actually happening. And I want to draw one analogy. I was talking about this at a conference. Uh, tell you what, uh, Catherine, we're, we're just seconds yes. from a break here, and uh, we're going to take that break, and we'll come back after it. And also after the break, folks, we want to hit some of the latest uh, that's going on with uh, RFID and uh, some of the, this controversial technology that uh, may be watching exactly what it is you're picking up from the stores, what you are purchasing and, and putting it to use. You're listening to Crosstalk on VCY America. We'll be back in just one minute. Back to Genesis with Dr. John Morris, scientist with the Institute for Creation Research. Dr. Morris, do creationists have any evidence for creation? Chris, think about it. Creationists have exactly the same evidence that evolutionists have. We have the same fossils, the same Grand Canyon. We just interpret it differently. Remember that science has to do with observation in the present. But discerning the ultimate origins of things in the unobserved past, that's different. Creation and evolution are both based on our assumptions about the past. Were past origins accomplished by supernatural processes such as described in the Bible, or were they accomplished by the natural processes we see today? I'm convinced that the processes of today are incapable of producing what we see. Supernatural input was necessary. That supernatural input is described back in Genesis. For more on Genesis, visit our website at icr.org. This is Chris O'Brien. Thanks for going back to Genesis.
Privacy concerns our topic today here on Crosstalk with Dr. Catherine Albrecht. She's authored uh, a, a number of uh, books and articles, uh, spy chips, and also the spy chips threat, why Christians should resist RFID and electronic surveillance. And uh, Catherine, we were talking about uh, just the, 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 the spying, the gathering of information on individuals through simple means of using Internet searches, which we all utilize, uh, email back and forth. And uh, you said you had a special illustration about something dealing with Sheridan. Yeah, well, I, I don't want to. I don't want to pinpoint them. This could be the Holiday Inn or or the Marriott or anybody else. But I, but I was giving a, a speech and I was talking about the way that Gmail is designed specifically to capture our information. And the analogy that I drew is, I said, it, what if this hotel were to tell every conference guest here that there are three floors of the hotel with absolutely free rooms, and you, you're welcome to just go and stay in them, and they're just going to give them to you for free. There's only one catch. The rooms are rigged with microphones and cameras. Hmm. I think most of the guests would say, you know, <laughs> I think I'll pay for a room. Thank you. I'd rather plunk down $150 and pay what a room is actually worth because that's not really free. So that's really what's happening with a lot of these free uh, email services. And not just email. It's also the case with Facebook. It's the case with a lot of these online cloud storage programs. It's the case with um, virtually every service on the Internet now that is free. If you read the fine print, you will see that they're granting themselves access to all of the things that you do on that service. And that's really unprecedented. It's a very new way of thinking about uh, privacy or a lack of it. And I think most people are really not prepared to navigate that effectively. You mentioned Facebook, and several months back there was an article that was in the uh, London Daily Mail that indicated shoppers would soon be automatically recognized when they walk into a shop using a controversial camera called Face Deals, uh, a camera that uses mm-hmm. photos uploaded to Facebook to recognize people as they walk in. Is there any evidence that this has been put into motion anywhere? You know, I read that as well, and I think that the whole uh, community of Facebook users was all horrified. I think if they were doing something like that, they probably wouldn't tell us. Hmm. That, that's, that's my take on that. Um, Facebook has literally billions of photographs of people's faces. They have more photos of human beings and indeed more photos, period, than any other service, location, database on earth. So that is the go-to place. If you wanted to do a facial recognition system that was absolutely airtight and worldwide, you would go directly to Facebook where people have uploaded all of these photos. And I remember back in 1997-98, there was a big hoopla about uh, driver's license photos being made available commercially to marketers and such. And many states actually passed laws saying, well, you have to get your picture taken for a driver's license photo. So we have a law in this state that says you can't, uh, the, the DMV is not able to sell or share that information with marketers. Well, that's so quaint now. You know, here we are 15 years later, and the idea that your photo would be a commodity that you could protect is just crazy now because people are taking other people's photos. Even if you don't have a Facebook account, there's a pretty good chance that you were at somebody's party, their Christmas party, their their birthday party, their, their confirmation, their bar mitzvah, their whatever, and somebody took a picture and labeled all the people in the picture and popped it right up there on Facebook. Hmm. And in fact, Facebook has programs that facilitate this. When you upload a photo to Facebook, Facebook, uh, for a time, and I believe they're doing this on many people's accounts now automatically, will put a box, they'll put a little square around each face. They've got the ability to recognize the shape of a face. And then it will prompt the person who posted the photo to enter the name of that person. Now, they're not doing that for your convenience. Mm -hmm. They're doing that because they want to build this gigantic facial recognition database, and they are in the best position to do that than any other company on Earth. Let's uh, hit another privacy issue. Uh, RFID, uh, controversial technology, is it being utilized? How is it being utilized today? Yeah, that's really gotten out of control. You know, we wrote the book on RFID back in 2006, Spy Chips, which was a top 10 Amazon bestseller. We got a lot of uh, people aware of the the threat posed by radio frequency identification microchips, uh, tiny microchips that are connected to little miniature antennas inside that can be um, woven into fabrics. They can be embedded into the soles of shoes. They can be pressed into ID cards. They can even be injected into flesh. 
And in 2006, the things that we were talking about when that book first came out, the RFID industry and the retail industry and the government, they all said, oh, no, all of those things are pie in the sky. They'll never happen. This is paranoid. Well, virtually every single thing that we wrote about in the book has come to pass. And we knew that it would because we did not conjecture to write the book. We actually went through 30,000 source documents, and it's all very carefully footnoted. It's not a dry and boring book, uh, by the way, despite the footnotes and the research. Um, But we documented that everything that was in the book was something that someone said they were going to do. So it's a little surprise that they went on to actually do that. Mm -hmm. So there are a couple of places where RFID, I believe, poses a huge threat, and nobody knows about it. One of them is in border states bordering Mexico and Canada. It is possible to get a driver's license, and in fact, when you go to the DMV, they'll try to encourage you to get this special driver's license called an enhanced driver's license. And what it lets you do, it lets you cross the border into Canada or Mexico without needing a passport. So it's kind of like a combo driver's license passport. Well, what they don't tell you, or if they do, it's in the fine print and they they dismiss the risks, is that embedded in that enhanced driver's license is a microchip and an antenna that can be read through walls. It can be read from 50 feet away. It can be read across the street. And if you have that in your pocket or your wallet or your purse, as you approach the border, the border crossing folks are able to pull up your image and your information on the screen before you get to the border. That's, that's the reason they do it. But it also means, and here's the part that's really strange, when they chose the type of RFID to put into the enhanced driver's licenses, they could have selected from a whole host of technologies. There are versions of this that are encrypted. There are versions with a short read range. There are versions that only operate if you have special um, security clearances. They chose the version that is used for tracking inventory. And, in fact, even the RFID folks who wanted this to happen all wrote in in the comment period and said, don't use that version. It's craziness. The version is called EPC. It stands for Electronic Product Code, and it is meant to replace the UPC barcode. So in in the future, all of the retailers, and this is like, you know, Kohl's and and American Eagle and, 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 and Walmart and all these various stores, Target, in the future... They want to replace the barcode with with these RFID tags and place reader devices in all the shelves and in all the doorways and in all the warehouses and the forklifts so that they can keep track of all the inventory that has these little microchips on it. Well, that's the standard that the Department of Homeland Security chose to put into enhanced driver's licenses. The barcode standard, it has no encryption. It's open in the air. It's easily cloned and hacked. It's easily captured. You can make your own version of it within seconds of picking, picking up somebody else's. So it's really insecure. But more disturbing still, their choice of that version of RFID for the driver's licenses means that if you have an enhanced driver's license from Michigan or New York or Washington State or any of these states, and you walk into a Walmart store, just as an example, and you stand in front of the, 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 the underwear aisle, you stand in front of the, the rack full of, uh, you know, fruit of the loom underwear, the underwear rack can actually read your driver's license through your wallet, through your pocket, through your purse while you're standing there. Wow. And not only can Walmart read the um, enhanced driver's license through your, your pocket, but they can't avoid reading it. Because it, of the nature of the technology, it, anytime there's an RFID tag brought within range of one of those underwear shelves, mm-hmm. the underwear shelf is going to read it and transmit it to Walmart's database. They can't help it. So when I looked at the big picture of this, I said, why in the world would the Department of Homeland Security choose to put into people's driver's licenses, which are now being carried by hundreds of thousands or even millions of Americans, why would they choose a standard that not only can, but will be read automatically by every Walmart store in the country. Well, Walmart is the nation's biggest retailer. And if you want to be able to surreptitiously track the public, what better way to do it than use a standard that will automatically be picked up by Walmart. And ultimately, they want to put this standard in every store, in every doorway. We talked about a patent in our book, Spy Chips, by IBM that they patented something called the Person Tracking Unit. What an awful name. 
Well, the person tracking unit is this idea that they would put these readers to pick up these signals into bus stops, train stations, museums, theaters, libraries, even elevators and public restrooms, so that every single place you go, if you have an EPC tag on you, and what better way to do this than through a driver's license, mm -hmm. then the actual walls of the bathroom could be identifying you and timing how long you stood there and whether or not you washed your hands. Wow. Catherine, uh, the, on another aspect is the under-the-skin microchips. It seems of, there hasn't been much news attention of these uh, during recent years. Does that mean they're no longer a factor or issues? That's just what it means. I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the good news. So let me share a positive story with you. Um, they were in the news a lot back in 2006 and 2007. And in fact, it was terrifying because uh, they had gained major traction. The Verichip Corporation has an implantable version of this technology. The microchip antenna is encapsulated in a little tic-tac-sized capsule of glass that can be injected into a person's flesh using uh, an injection, you know, a, a, a needle. Um, it's not tiny. Don't worry. You're not going to get one of these accidentally with your next immunization. It's big, and you would know if somebody was putting one of these in you, believe me. But when that technology was being promoted in 2006 and 7, it was being promoted, and, and they, it was gaining a lot of popularity. Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, got on board. They were running a clinical trial of putting these into diabetic patients. There was an Alzheimer's care center in Florida that was going to put this into 200 Alzheimer's patients. The head of Health and Human Services, Tommy Thompson, when he retired, he actually took a position on the board of directors for the Verichip Corporation. In 2005, they got FDA approval for their implantable microchip, and all signs pointed to this technology absolutely taking off. Uh, their stock was trading at about $11 a share, which for them was unprecedented. And even the director of IT for Harvard University wrote an article, John Holamka, in which he said he, he thought this was a great idea. Let's all get on board. Well, right about that time, we did a prayer vigil. And I know that you have uh, Christian listeners. I am a born-again, Bible-believing Christian. I wear my religion on my sleeve these mm. days because I think the time is short. Yes. So I flew to West Palm Beach, Florida, and headed up a prayer vigil in a march um, in outside of that Alzheimer's care center. And by the way, i got to tell one little story about just the faithfulness of the Lord. I could not get a pastor to agree to lead the prayer for us. I called every church in the phone book. And finally, I said, okay, Lord, well, I guess you just want me to step out on faith. I'll just go, and if need be, I'll just lead the prayer. Well, we got out there. We marched, and as we were marching, holding signs, you know, no microchipping. You can see all these pictures, by the way, at antichips.com. A pickup truck pulls up alongside of us and rolls down the window, and a man leans out, and he says, I couldn't agree with what I'm seeing on these signs more. He says, I'm a pastor. Is there any way I can help you? Wow. Wow. <laughs> The Lord literally sent us a pastor on the way to the to the location. So he went with us and led the prayer vigil for us. It was extraordinary. And it was right after that that we were able to break the story that these implantable microchips cause cancer in laboratory animals. And no, they had hidden this fact from the FDA when they got their approval, but we uncovered it and worked with the Associated Press. And long story short, put an end to the chipping, killed the company, destroyed their stock value, and now nobody's being chipped with microchips. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Dr. Catherine Albrecht with us here today on Crosstalk. A quick break and come back here on just another issue or two. Stay with us. It only takes a quick look around to see that the world is a mess. There is something very sinister happening behind the scenes in the areas of money, politics, and religion in our country today. What's worse, we are not being fully informed by Wall Street or government officials, and most of the media is only repeating what the politicians and bankers tell them. In the book, A Nation in Crisis, authors Larry Bates and Chuck Bates, news executives with IRN USA News, unravel the confusion and unmask the mystery surrounding the institutions controlling our money, our government, and our religions. They also give their thoughts on how one should respond to the demise of the U.S. dollar, declining morality, the muzzling of faith, and the chaos of the culture. The hard-covered book, A Nation in Crisis, is available for a donation of $20 to VCY America, which can be made by calling 1-800-729-9829. Ask for the book, A Nation in Crisis. Again, the number toll-free, 1-800-729-9829.
This is Crosstalk on VCY America as we're addressing the issue of privacy concerns. And, folks, we are just scratching the surface on this today. Our guest, Dr. Catherine Albrecht, who is a privacy expert, a consumer activist. And, uh, Catherine, uh, as we're talking about these RFID chips, uh, I mean, we are, uh, it seems every fall we're hearing news stories about uh, schools that are trying to employ these in, in student ID cards and, or backpack cards or identifications, but also in the area of, uh, of uh, recreation and theme parks. Uh, even Disney's getting involved with this. Yeah, Disney has got to be one of the worst cases of this. Um, you know, when, when kids go to Disneyland and they celebrate their birthday, they, that's the happiest place on earth. You know, everybody who's been there as a kid has memories of how wonderful Disneyland was. Well, Disney just spent, and see if you can process this number, they just spent a billion dollars to upgrade their two theme parks in the U.S., a billion dollars to upgrade two theme parks to incorporate RFID throughout the entire park. Now, if you do the math on this, you know, think about what it would take to upgrade Disneyland or Disney World to have some RFID readers and some wristbands to give out to people. A million dollars, $10 million, $30 million, try a thousand million dollars. It's not even conceivable. So, and, and the only way that you could justify that, like if you're Disney, they say that they're doing this. They've, they've put RFID readers on all the rides. They've put them on all the concessions, which, you know, the lemonade stand and the hot dog place or the whatever. They've, they, they issue now to the guests as they arrive at the park an RFID wristband on their right wrist with a microchip in it using this numbering technology that the people in the park use to buy stuff. So it really is, a, it's, it's not quite a mark on your right hand or forehead to buy and sell, but it's getting mighty close. Hmm. And the part that I cannot comprehend in all of this until, I'll, I'll give you the punchline in a second, but I couldn't figure out how do you expect to make a return on investment by spending a billion dollars, even if you spend a hundred million dollars or two hundred million dollars, my gosh, how do you make that back? But how do you earn back a billion dollars? It, it makes no sense. And they say, well, we're going to speed up the rides because you'll be able to have this little wristband and you press it. And, and I would encourage people to start page um, this Disney program and look at the pictures. We say start page instead of Google it around here. But if you start page it, you will see that they have these polished metal spheres. And in the polished metal sphere is this glowing green outline of Mickey Mouse's head and ears. And it's like a neon glow coming through the metal. It's really creepy. It looks like something out of a sci-fi movie. Mm. And that's what children are expected to press their right hand to in order to get on to all these fun rides and in order to get food. So when I, when I got to actually researching this, I said it makes no sense. A billion dollars to set that up makes no sense. Well, what I then discovered is that Disney is in cahoots with Carnegie Mellon University and with the federal government creating, basically doing very high-tech futuristic research on environments. And what Disney is, and, and I would encourage everybody listening to boycott Disney because of this, Disney essentially is a self-contained city, and any technology that the government wanted to test out or that the Carnegie Mellon researchers wanted to test out, if they put it in place at Disney, you are basically a captive in that location. You have to go to the bathroom there. You have to eat there. You have to sit down on a bench there. Everything you do is within the confines of this self-contained city. And that's when the light bulb went on, and then I began to actually look at Disney Research. I think it's DisneyResearch.com, and they actually acknowledge this. They say, we've got a living laboratory at the Disney theme parks where people come in, and they're basically our captive research subjects, and we can study them. And I believe that, that, that Disney right now is playing the role of the, the, the laboratory rats. The people who are going there are the guinea pigs for what I believe the federal government would like to do on a large scale to the entire nation or, indeed, even to the entire planet. And then that ties back in with the enhanced driver's licenses and all of the rest of it starts to make a little more sense. But I wouldn't go to Disney if you paid me at this point. 
Wow. One other issue, and folks, let's open the lines here, 800-733-9829. If you have a question or comment, 800-733-9829. Catherine, increasingly we're hearing of the increased use of drones over U.S. airspace. And in addition to that, we're hearing of these micro drones, the the size of bugs or flies or birds that can carry cameras and microphones. Can can you kind of uh, briefly enlighten us as to what's going on? Yeah, you know, the, the, I think that there's a spiritual component to this, and, and none of this is really going to make sense until you see the, the big picture. And the, the way I actually became a, a privacy advocate is back when I was eight years old, my grandmother in the 1970s in a little farmhouse in the Midwest sat me down and told me that there would be a time when people would not be able to buy or sell without a number and a mark on their right hand or their forehead, and that, of course, is the mark of the beast. Well, she made me promise never to take the mark. And in the 1970s, I could not wrap my head around how it would be possible to even buy or sell with a number, because back then we had no Internet, we had no credit cards. They existed, but I didn't know anybody who had one. Mm-hmm. There, were, there weren't even computers. My dad worked at a computer lab that has less power than your iPhone that took up, like, four city blocks so we, and used punch cards. So there was no way to understand how in the world would you buy and sell with a number. So I made a promise to my grandmother that, first of all, I would never take such a mark. And second of all, that if I began to see something like that occurring in my lifetime, that I would pick up my Bible and know that the other things in that Bible were true as well. And I think we're coming to the point now, we are the first generation, and and even literally the first 10 years of people living on Earth in all of our history, who have now the technological capability of implementing the mark of the beast. It was never possible before. And some of the brightest minds in history have tried to figure out how it could be done. Isaac Newton, the brilliant physicist, devoted over a million words written in quill pen trying to understand it, but he couldn't. Hmm. And the Bible tells us that all of this doesn't make sense to the people until they're actually at the time it is occurring. Even even John himself, seeing the revelation, it was, was blown away. He didn't know what he was even understanding or seeing, but he was told to write it down because the words were faithful and true. Mm-hmm. And so here we are, seeing the fruition of what was written 2,000 years ago you know, by, by an elderly disciple of Christ in, in, in exile on, on the island off the coast of Greece there, where he saw all of this unfolding. And when you ask yourself, how would it be possible that we would have one world religion, one world government, one world currency, and the ability to control every last person on the globe? And the Bible says, it's. Uh, by the way, if people want to find this, it's, it's in the book of Revelation, the last book in your Bible. It is chapter 13, which is easy to remember because it's kind of an unlucky number, and so you can you know, use that to, as your memory cue. And then go to the very end of chapter 13, verses 16 through 18. It talks about a time when all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and bond, which means imprisoned or enslaved, will be caused to receive a mark on their right hand or their forehead, without which they will not be able to buy or sell. And that, of course, is the mark of of the beast. It's Mm -hmm. 666, which is the number of man or of a man. And when when we start talking about this, 2,000 years ago, couldn't imagine it. Today, you've got people making payments with things on their right wrist at Disneyland right Mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. You've got people carrying around payment devices that link up to the global brain. And, in fact, that's not even my phrase. That's a phrase that the people who like what's happening call it the technologists. So now let's bring this back to the drones. I believe that the the thing that is going to become the beast, which is, of course, Satan, what he wants are the powers of God. And we know in Revelation that he requires worship. In order to receive this mark, you must bow down and worship either the beast or his image because he wants to be God. I mean, Satan's always one of the powers of God. Well, one of the powers of God is the ability to know every time a sparrow falls from the sky or to number the, the hairs on your head. And Satan, on, uh, uh, of his own volition, is, I believe, working to create those abilities on the planet so that when he comes and embodies whatever it is that he's building, that he will be able to know when a sparrow falls from the sky because all the sparrows will be microchipped and transmitting their information to the global brain. 
So when you start talking about things like drones or even a, a more localized and creepier version to me, which is Google Glass, it's these new glasses that Google has come out with that enable you to become essentially the eyes and ears of this, of this surveillance apparatus. You walk around and everything you see is recorded and sent back to the cloud, back to the global brain. Everything you hear, there's a microphone. It all goes recorded and goes back to the cloud, to the global brain. So individual people will become the agents of, of this data collection entity. Right. So not only drones in the sky, but every physical object on Earth will be tracked, um, given a number, and somehow linked into this grand system. And I think it's no mistake that the system through which all of this is coming to pass is referred to. We've got two names for it the web, and where there is a web, there is a spider, or the net, and where there is a net, there is something that is a predator and something that is prey. So we have created essentially all of the, the capability to identify, number, track, and ultimately control every single last human being on planet Earth through the web or through the net. Wow. Well, our lines are packed here. Let's begin in Wisconsin. John, you're on the air. Yes. Uh, afternoon, uh, Catherine. Hello, I, John. Uh, out of a curiosity, typed in my own name and then pressed search, and I was surprised to find that uh, various letters were collected. And uh, this is from obscure sites and all that, just uh, little letters and all that. And um, what, what do you mean by letters, John? Oh, uh, just posting on different sites. Oh, okay. And uh, so that was uh, kind of shocking that uh, letters to what I thought were uh, not going to be collected, you know, just a letter of uh, commentary, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just wanted to throw that out there, and I just want to ask one more question. Aluminum foil, is that going to, if you wrap your uh, ID cards and stuff like that, would that be a good deterrent? Okay. Yeah, so let me see if I can address those. Number one, it, it's shocking when you punch in your own name or, worse yet, when you put in your home address and you see that Google has a photo of your house. I have friends at church who, you know, there's their old van and their dad is standing in the doorway, you know, photographed by Google with the Street View van. So it's, it's really becoming, uh, I think you're just seeing the tip of the iceberg of what they know about you when you type it in and what they actually show you. As far as aluminum foil goes, believe it or not, those tinfoil hat people are onto something, aluminum foil does block radio frequency transmissions. So if you do have something that you suspect of containing an RFID tag, if you wrap it completely in aluminum foil, then when the reader tries to read the signal, it will actually bounce off of the aluminum and not be able to uh, return a signal. Oh, so okay. it actually does work. And there are RFID blocking wallets that are available online. You can start page them, uh, RFID blocking wallets. They're kind of expensive, but they actually do work. Thank you, John. Let's go to Trish in Ohio. You're on the air, Trish. Yes, Catherine, thank you so much because um, we've been using StartPage for a long time. And I just uh, have two questions. One is um, I didn't hear you mention passports. I may have missed that. Are ARFIDs in some passports? And the other is do you know when Disney will begin their billion-dollar debacle? And I'll go now and listen. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Trish. Well, let me answer the first one first. B Disney has already invested that money. And those RFID wristbands are already coming out. You can start page it. You can look up a Disney RFID wristband. You can see pictures of them. And look up Disney RFID globe or sphere, and you can see pictures of the reader device, which is really creepy. So that's that's already happening. Um, I'm trying to think. The other question was... The, the other was passports, and we'll have you picked up on the other side here at the break. Uh, Catherine Albrecht with us here today on Crosstalk. A quick 60-second break, and uh, back to more information. You're listening to Crosstalk on VC. CY America. For the Worldview Weekend Minute, I'm Brandon House. Our website's worldviewweekend.com. We're continuing our series on money and a biblical worldview. 20 uh, points or characteristics that will help us to have a biblical worldview for money. Number six, those that love money will not find satisfaction. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 10 through 11 says, Those who love silver will not be satisfied with silver. 
know, it's not speaking against silver or money or having a savings account. It's just saying it's the those who love it. In our last commentary, we looked at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, that the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, at this point, number six, those that love money, well, they won't be satisfied with money. They won't be satisfied with silver. In fact, some of the mi- most miserable people you probably know or have heard about are people that are rich. Uh, it doesn't, in the end, bring them joy, does it? The true joy comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ through faith and repentance. So let's have a biblical worldview when it comes to money and realize that's not where our joy or hope comes from. Dr. Catherine Albrecht is our guest here today on Crosstalk, going right back to the phone lines of that last caller, also dealing with the topic of passports and passport protection there, uh, Catherine. I can tackle that really quickly. Um, a bunch of us, when the passport um, was proposed, the RFID in the passport was proposed, 98% of comments, uh, of thousands of public comments opposed it. They did it anyway, but we did get one concession. They used encrypted RFID with a very short read range in the passport, and when the cover is closed, it cannot be read. So what I recommend to people, if you do have to cross the border into Mexico or Canada, whatever you do, do not get an enhanced driver's license. And if you must get a passport, get the blue booklet passport because it's got a better version of RFID technology in it. Let's go to Navarre, Florida. Rick, you're on the air. Uh, I can't be effusive enough on my praise of start page. I mean, I've been using it now for several years, and one of the things I've discovered, and Catherine, tell me if this is good technique or bad, uh, every time I go to a website, I always uh, find a way of going through the start page search engine first and, and then going to the site off of the search results menu. That way I'm always going through your server. Since I started doing that, I've, I've never had a virus and never had a problem of any kind. Okay, it, it, also I've disabled the cookies on, on my browser. I, are there any other techniques I can use? Is, is what I'm yeah. Using? Well, uh, that thank you so much for for your praise of start page. We're, we're really trying hard to make it uh, everything you need it to be. One thing though, I want to caution people: simply getting to a site because you originally searched it on start page doesn't make it private unless you go through the proxy. So let me see if I can explain this. When you search on start page, you get back a bunch of pages. When you click one, you leave our protections, and you go out onto the Wild West Internet to whatever page you're going to. So if you search CNN on start page, and then you click the CNN link, you're on CNN's website now, and we can't protect you. So CNN, if they want to place cookies or do whatever to you, they can. Except we have, we're the only um, web search engine on the entire Internet to offer this. We have a proxy service. And what this does, and I only use it when I really want privacy, is if you click underneath a link, like I I just looked up tacos, (laughs) of all things, and you'll see it says View by XQuick Proxy. Now, XQuick is our sister search engine. We have two, StartPage and XQuick. They're both the same except StartPage is Google results and XQuick is other search engine results. But the XQuick Proxy is our proprietary proxy. And what it means is when you click that, let's say you look up CNN, and then it says View by XQuick Proxy, we will go for you to CNN's website load all of the images and content from CNN onto our servers, and then load them on back to you so you never make contact even with CNN. So if it's something really private or if you think it might have malware or it might be a dangerous website, you just don't want to go there directly, you can go there through the XQuick proxy. And if you go to YouTube and you search for XQuick proxy or better yet, start page proxy, you'll see a video of me, my smiling face, explaining exactly how to use the proxy. So if you didn't catch all that, I know people are driving and doing other stuff. If, if that didn't make sense, go to YouTube and look up start page proxy or just go to start page and look up start page proxy and watch the video. Thank you, Rick. To Teresa, thank you for calling. You're on the air. Hi. Um, thank you for taking my call. Um, I was just um, wondering if Kath would, would recommend a private email service instead of Hotmail, Gmail, and Yahoo. She had mentioned that earlier. Does she recommend another, uh, a more private email service that's out there? 
Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, we're actually developing one. Um, what what people don't realize is that Gmail exists specifically to read all of your mail. That's why it's there. They do not provide you with a five dollar free email service every month uh, because they're just nice to you. They do it because it gives them yet another way to capture additional information about yourself every time you write an email. So we uh, two years ago um, began building from the ground up the world's most private email, which is called Start Mail. It will be coming out um, hopefully by the end of this year, and it is not only fully encrypted and totally private, not only do we not read your email like Gmail does and Hotmail and Yahoo do, we don't, and we can't. If you choose to encrypt it, it won't even be available to us to see. It's going to, we can't do that for free. It's actually going to cost you the $5 a month that the email costs us to, to create and deliver, but it will give you the, the benefit of not being tracked. And if people would like to be beta testers on that, maybe help us kick the tires when it comes out, I can offer that to uh, Crosstalk listeners. And here's how you can do it. If you send an email to beta, B-E-T-A, like alpha beta, at startpage.com and say that you heard Catherine on Crosstalk, then we will uh, put you on the beta list. We'll give you a free trial of, I don't know, 30, 60 days where you can kick the tires and help us uh, check it out, see if you like it, tell us what you think when it first comes out. And your listeners can be the very first people to get that. So it's beta, B-E-T-A, at startpage.com. Just say you heard Catherine on this radio show. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, let's go to Mobile, Alabama. Vicki, you're on the air. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Um, I was wondering about the uh, insert in the microchip in newborn i was i have been told that they have that in the obama plan and i was very think, yeah let me let me address that fortunately the obamacare rumor is false there is no microchipping provision in the obamacare legislation i have blogged about this on my website if you go to my website katherinealbrecht.com or even just easier kma show.com kma are my initials kma show.com click on the blog and search for obamacare and you can see i wrote a full explanation of how that rumor got started and how it is absolutely false now as far as chipping newborns goes, there is no chipping of newborns happening anywhere on planet Earth that I am aware of. There was a company called, of all things, uh, Xmark, which was a division of the Verichip Corporation, the implant company, that made ankle bracelets that actually are being placed on newborns. In some cases, even before they cut the umbilical cord, they're putting an RFID tag onto the ankles of these babies, and they do it to, to um, prevent abduction. At least that's their explanation. Uh, they have reader devices in the doorway, so if a baby were to be taken off the premises, it would set off an alarm. Uh, we talk about this in our book, Spy Chips, that when they actually did the research, the Center for Missing and Exploited Children discovered that it is exactly the hospitals that are deploying this technology that are big and impersonal that are more likely to have an abduction than the smaller facilities where there's just human beings watching the babies instead of technology. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the call here. And, folks, we are out of time. Dr. Catherine Albrecht has been our guest. If you would, uh, uh, Catherine, again, just share a website where our listeners can stay abreast on these issues. Absolutely. Startpage.com is the world's most private search engine. Beta at startpage.com is where to email to get on board our uh, email program. And my website is katherinealbrecht.com or kmashow.com. Great. Well, God bless you, Catherine. Thanks for being with us today here on Crosstalk. God bless you. It's been a real a real pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Catherine Albrecht, our guest here today on Crosstalk, and you have the contact information. Uh, stay informed on these vital issues. Thanks for joining us today right here on Crosstalk. You've been listening to Crosstalk via satellite and the Internet from VCY America. Views expressed may or may not be those of this station. For a CD of today's program, send a donation of $6 or more to VCY Tape Ministry, 3434 West Kilbourne Avenue, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53208. Or download by RSS or podcast from CrosstalkAmerica.com. And join us again for Crosstalk. Crosstalk.